Sego, I'm Aisha Smith Belgaba, a chef and journalist here from Six Nations of the Grand River. And what I'm doing here right now is digging up some wild strawberry plants. I've always really been interested in food my entire life. I've spent my life in kitchens, gardens, in my backyard with my family members. There are a lot of people in our community here in Six Nations who are reclaiming our food ways and systems from gardening at home to gardening in community plots and foraging, picking wild things like I did here today. These wild strawberries grow all over the reserve and I'm not the only one that knows that. So welcome to my home territory of Six Nations and we're gonna be having a lot of incredible conversations with experts from here on Six Nations about food sovereignty, what it means, historical timelines, and why it's still important today. Together with our experts from here on Six Nations, we are going to walk through the true history of Canada and what it did to weaponize our indigenous foods against us as an extreme tool of colonization. <laughs> my life. Rick, thank you so much for coming to my home today to give us your words of wisdom and insight on our historical timelines in regards to our foods. Thank you for inviting me. As you see, food is one of my favorite topics. <laughs> I love to eat. And food has probably been one of the most misunderstood parts of the history of colonization. You got to think way back in the beginning, our people were given these sacred foods in which we, as sacred beings, were meant to sustain ourselves. And then all of a sudden the French wanted to control the fur trade. Now we're talking about the mid-1600s. And what they realized is the Haudenosaunee were in the middle of their economic plan. And so they decided they're going to destroy us. So they sent their French armies against our people. They first raided the Senecas. In the middle they found that they could raid Onondaga, cut the heart out, raid the Senecas, which is a bigger territory. But what they did was something very strange they began to burn the fields of corn. Now you got to remember, in the old villages at that time, surrounded by acres and acres of corn. I dare say you could go up to five miles away from your village core, your planting. So the French came realizing, well, we can burn down their longhouses, maybe defeat them with our weapons, but if we destroy the corn, we destroy the very fabric of their life. And it almost came true. They burned acres and acres of corn, so much so that our, the people at the time wondered, who are these strange people who make a war on corn? What, why, would, why would anybody do that? Because uh, corn is sacred, uh, a part of this creation plan. 1777, George Washington, who was the commander at the time, decided he, he wanted to annihilate the Haudenosaunee because Joseph Bratt was be quite a, was pestering them quite a bit with these raids he was doing off in their villages. And so, Washington hatched this campaign, it was called the Indian Expedition, mm -hmm. and it was meant to wipe out all of our villages, and then all of our crops, and all of our orchards. And it was a three-pronged attack, three armies to head into the heart of our country. And it almost succeeded. In a matter of four months, they destroyed about 50 villages, and millions of bushels of uh, corn and crops and uh, orchards and the journals of the American soldiers are really quite telling because some of them say they spent all day setting fire to cornfields. So Rick, would you say that at every chapter of history since the beginning of a Canada, that food has been weaponized against us in some way or how in order to make us submit to whatever the Canadian government is trying to do at that time? I know it's hard to imagine that somewhere there's some room where these people are crafting our future, but that's exactly what happened. Uh, ever since there's been a a colonial administration or a Canadian administration, somebody's been plotting our future. 
part of that future is our demise. So notice, though, they didn't choose to kill us all. They didn't choose to enslave us all. And they didn't choose to isolate all of us. And they chose this idea that our survival would be dependent on transforming our character. <clears throat> And you know, there are days when I wake up and I look around and I said, they really succeeded. We're a transformed people. We think in English, we, we participate in the larger economy, we send our kids off to their schools, we, we do everything that they expected us to do, except there's something in us that still resists. There's something about our people too, that despite all of that, we're, we have this resiliency. And I'd like to compare it to a corn seed, you know, because a corn you can plant in any temperature, almost any kind of soil, you give it the right nourishment and it comes up again, it keeps coming up again. Mm -hmm. It's changed through time. We've got many colors of corn, many kinds of corn. So in many ways, we are, we are like corn. We're resilient in that way. We, we can still exist on this land, despite the dramatic changes that took place. But I really kind of believe that, that the future is dependent on how well this generation and the next generation embrace those cultural teachings with the sense of liberation. I started off with a tiny space over here. I'm Adrian Lickers Xavier, and I'm an assistant professor in Indigenous Studies at McMaster University. I'm also currently on and live at Six Nations, um, officially Six Nations of the Grand River Territory in Southern Ontario, Canada. Food access is about having it. Right? Do I have any? Do I have food? Can I get it? And can I get it to me? Mm -hmm. um, food security is, do I have enough? Not even could I get to it, because I may not be able to, right. but there might be reasons why even if I'm able to get to it, I can't have it. Like what? Uh, things like our health, our ability, the cost of it. Mm -hmm. um, you can go to a food bank and if there's a fee, you might not have $5 or whatever the fee may be. And that's literally a barrier sometimes for people thinking that they won't be helped no matter what. Right. Um, the mental barrier of not having enough and being unwilling to tell people. Mm -hmm. um, the social mental health barrier of thinking that this is how it's supposed to be or somehow you are at fault for not having enough. Mm -hmm. So you might have places and resources that are offering you access and you still might not be prepared for that. And then on the flip side of that, the security piece of it is also about the definition of food security being, you know, the appropriate amount of culturally relevant, available food to sustain you. Right. That culturally relevant wasn't always in there. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, what we're, we have access to and food security is if you have access to every single day processed food only, that might not be health. When a person doesn't have enough, it's really front and center of their mind. Right. When you don't even have to think about it and it just shows up, mm -hmm. you could be fed the perfect foods to be in perfect health all the time, but you have no connection to food or where it came from. Is that the same? No, to me it's not. Part of the food sovereignty that I want is to know that what I have and where it came from, that's where that journey starts for people, right? That's how you connect food to community, that's how you connect yourself to the land, that's how you get into those other conversations. I introduced people to, to do things in their home. There was nothing, like this was grass a few years ago, five, four or five years ago. But then I just started putting things in it so that when people came, I'm like, you only need a tiny spot. You only need a little pot to grow things in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, just that strength that you gain from growing a food of your own, like something that you grew, even if it's like a lettuce seed in a coffee cup that grows two leaves and you eat those, that makes your body go, wait a second, I like that. Let's twist this big guy out of here. There's so much history about our food. There's so much discussion about how it was taken. And yes, I could be out fighting against that. I prefer to teach people to fight quietly and teach them to maybe not fight quietly, but to
to grow because that's how you fight back. That's how you take back what belongs to you in terms of knowledge. Because I know five, six, seven generations are who I must care for. One to seven, that's my job. The seven before me did all of this, kept, took care of it so that it could be here for me. These plants are most happy when they eat their food, right. just like us, right? So, okay. yeah, so we're back to that connection of things. This is the, the wild mustard I was talking about. So just take a little nibble. Mm. Best salad dressing you'll ever make, best. This is gonna sound so crazy, and I'm not a super fan of hot dogs, but when I smell this, I think, oh, wouldn't a hot dog be good with that? <laughs> We're here at Revitalizing Our Sustenance today and I'm going to be speaking with Denise Miller and it's so important for me to have this conversation with her here where she's doing her project because it's so important to the community. So can you tell me when Revitalizing Our Sustenance officially started? Revitalizing is like we're reawakening our food systems, we're reawakening our um, connection to the land and even just like reawakening our bodies and connecting to our food. This was my dad's um, family property. Mm -hmm. There's 27 acres. He gave it to me this past year, so um, this is kind of why we chose to have the garden project here. Even this year, we're building a mini longhouse, kind of where that flag is, that part. Oh, wow, um, that's cool. So that's kind of like a start of our, I guess, like facility structures. And why yeah. the why the longhouse? Um, I think it will connect a lot more people to kind of visualize and kind of see how we used to live mm -hmm. um, pre-contact. And it also is a great learning tool to being like, this is how we used to dry corn. This is how we grinded corn. Um, even just to kind of connect, I guess, have a deeper connection to our food too when we're harvesting it and preparing it. Can you take us back to the beginning the summer of the pandemic when you were just doing the garden with your dad because he did it too big. <laughs> and then the moment that you realized that this was meant for you. So I think when I was a kid, it was always there. But when I got to an adult and um, worked on the garden with my dad and my family, I think that's when I realized that doing a garden and working with your plants and food systems is a great way for healing, self-growth, and even to reconnect to your family because even now as a mother and in my relationship and when I was carrying her, um, planting and being around our food systems was a really, really great way to understand my partner better how to understand motherhood um, and responsibilities of being a mother and a good partner. And I always remember this quote that Elva Jamison gave me. She said, when you haven't grown a garden together, you're not ready for a baby. <laughs> <laughs> so luckily we had a garden before Maisie came and um, that was a really, um, that was like so true what she said because I think we really um, got to understand our relationship better and even just like becoming parents and trying to nurture a garden because it's like the same way you're growing a little seed <laughs> and you're trying to make them big and strong in it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and not scared. First tap. Tap, tap, tap. How has this project changed you and, and your life, really? Um, I think the project has changed me um, enormously, just with like the lifestyle that I was living before this project. I um, had kind of like uh, low mental health and was going through a lot of, um, I guess, like 
questioning what I was doing with my life and mm -hmm. um, through this project it has really I guess honed my identity and my responsibilities as a Haudenosaunee person and what I should be doing and also just like it's brought me so much joy and love <laughs> and oh, I'm gonna cry okay <laughs> so sorry <laughs> but yeah um it just like um brought me a lot of like i guess hope <laughs> oh right God. here yeah <laughs> nyawa for having us thanks for being so cute <laughs> and thank you for um letting us share our story. Everyone, we have Chandra Miracle here. She's come to my house and she's gonna give us a beautiful demonstration with all of these different tools here. And yeah, let's walk through it together. I'm always up for talking about corn and food. Any day is a good day to do that. So yes. thanks for having me. We'll have some stuff to show you to start off. Uh, of how we're going to begin the process of lying corn. Okay. Here we have some uh, Haudenosaunee corn. And this is a, a braid of corn. And so I'm just gonna pull some off and we're gonna start by taking the kernels off by hand. Okay. So I'll do one, you can do one. We're gonna put right. them in this bowl. This bunny and then bowl. I'm gonna show you another way. Okay. Because we're gonna kind of, we're gonna show a progression here. We're gonna build on a really uh, old way of doing things, and then kind of a middle way of doing things, and then maybe a really modern way of doing things. Okay. Here Chandra is showing us how to lie corn. First off, you have to take the kernels off of the cob. We're going to be doing a hand twist method, and then we're going to be using a machine where you put the cob through, give it a crank, and the kernels pop right off. Once that's done, you have to give your hardwood ash a sift to make sure there's not any hard chunks. Once that's completed, we get to move on into the kitchen where you put on a pot of water, bring it to a boil, put about a cup of your hardwood ash in and then about a cup to a cup and a half of your dried corn kernels. And as soon as those kernels hit the water, almost within seconds, you can see the color change to an orangish tone. You leave it in there boiling for about 45 minutes, give it a rinse, and you can start to see the color and texture change already. And then after that first initial boil with the hardwood ash, you then do two more boils after that with just plain water. And at the end of that third boil, you're gonna have a beautiful kernel of lied corn that's so luscious and so delicious. Yes, I love this stuff. Yes, I love to plant corn, harvest corn, cook corn, do all those kinds of things with traditional foods. I'm not personally a hunter, but my husband came from a hunting family. Mm -hmm. So if you can fish foods, hunt foods, gather wild, you know, so-called wild foods, harvest foods, you know, that's great. But that's not accessible for everyone. Right. So average folks are going to the grocery store. That is a system of itself that if you don't know how to navigate that, you're probably not as healthy as you could be. Mm -hmm. So for a while, I would just take people to the grocery store, teach them how to read a label, you know, teach them what these ingredients mean. You know, that, that's a skill that I think that you, as, as a mom and as, as, a, as a homemaker, mm -hmm. you know, a householder, head of my household, I realized a while ago, like, if I'm going to raise healthy people in this current climate, in this society, I need to know how to do that. Furthermore, you know, my happy life involves things like avocado. Yeah mango, cacao, which becomes chocolate, yeah. <laughs> coconut, you know, like, so the concept for me is what I call gakwa umwe, like original foods. So we live in an interconnected planet right now. So we don't need to say that we only can eat foods that existed within a Haudenosaunee landscape yeah. six, 700 years ago. We don't, I don't think we need to say that. That doesn't compromise our integrity as Haudenosaunee people or, or any indigenous people. Mm -hmm. All that stuff that Rick laid out for us, all that history, right? There's a lot of really uh, depressing stuff, yeah. you know, to learn about. Mm -hmm. Stuff that either makes you really depressed or really angry. Yeah. And, you know, and it should temporarily, but I guess what I'm saying is use that as your fuel. Use that as the fuel for your digestive fire. Yeah. You know, take that stuff and and when you're first learning about that, if it's 
if it's really wearing you down, just think about like making your own self a healthy person mm -hmm. in and of itself is an act of resistance. What I've learned is that it doesn't matter where you come from, where you live, there's always some type of path that you can take towards food sovereignty. It doesn't always mean that you're growing your own gardens, or maybe that means you're only growing your garden in one small pot on your balcony because you live in a high-rise building or something like that. Or maybe it's you're picking foods wisely from the grocery store by reading labels or researching what types of indigenous foods you could get from the grocery store. There's not one right way to do it. All the ways lead back to the same thing, and that's finding that connectivity to your culture, your people, and your food ways. And what is that in your hand? Strawberry. And it helps you bring yourself back and keeps you connected to Mother Earth and where we came from and the ways that have lasted us generations and that will last for generations to come. <laughs>